free and all that he's done for us right now in our political climate and the elections coming up we have people that are trying to win your vote by reminding you what they've done for you in this country or what they assume they've done for you but the person who deserves our utmost allegiance and our following and our love is this man that Isaiah 53 says that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. That's what Christ has done for us. And let's remind ourselves of that as we sing and love him more for it. And remain seated as we sing 117. Turn to Acts chapter 3. We're going to be reading from verse 8 through 18. Acts chapter 3, and then finally we'll stand for the reading of God's Word. (coughs) 
And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance you did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. If you'd please remain standing for the final song. Remain standing as we sing. It's still the cross. It's still the blood. It's still his dying act of love, compelling me to spend my life in giving everything for Christ. Yeah. 
Good morning. It is good to see a, a lot of new faces and the old ones. A couple of quick things. Had a note from Javier. Um, he's still, I believe he's down at Shepherd's Buffalo now, isn't he? Okay. Um, and just passed on his condolences to us with the passing of Lloyd. Uh, it, it was a great blessing for Lisa and I uh, to meet to meet in these last two years. We're very sorry, sorry for the emptiness that Brother Lloyd leaves in our beloved church. But now our beloved brother has already seen our Savior. He is already in paradise with our Savior, seeing him face to face and enjoying eternity with the Lord. It is up to us to continue the race ahead because we have the hope that one day we also shall see him face to face. Uh, appreciated that note from Javier. Uh, he also had some, uh, something happen with some kind of major headaches he was having. He did an ER run recently. So uh, just keep them in your prayers. A lot, of, a lot of pressure with that family right now. So but they're doing well. I look forward to seeing them again. Okay, I'm going to be, make a couple of, Quick, I hope, announcements. So if I mess them up, just let me know. So Mark Dotson, correct? Yes. All right. He referred to himself as a drive-by. Just saw the church came on in, and I appreciate you coming. I trust that our service will be a, a blessing to you. God would use it in some way. Also, we have back here Chris and Sandy Opitz. Now you know I wanted these cards. So I got to embarrass you for a minute. Uh, fairly new to the area. Uh, wanted to come and visit. It's good to have you out. I'm glad you could be with us. Again, I, I just trust the service will be profitable for you. And God would, would honor his time. So, And I'm not going to be this nice. Uh, Ryan, why don't you go ahead and introduce you and your family and put you on the spot for a minute. All right, well, it's good to have you all out. I'm glad you could join us. Um, he had called me during the week and uh, I was, it was one of multiple phone calls, but then we had, we found we had some, some common ground. There's a couple, when we go on to our counseling conference that we meet up with every year and uh, Scott and Leah Ashby, and they are starting a church, or they're, he pastors a church up in Toronto and so they went to school together, so it was a good, good common ground. I enjoyed it. Uh, I know there is something else I'm forgetting, so bear with me. If I come across it halfway, I'll stop the service and we'll make another announcement, and then we'll keep going. But we won't do that. Don't worry. All right, let's take our Bibles. Turn to Acts chapter three. I knew I forgot something. Uh, Stephen, could you please go get me? Uh, you know what? There's one on my desk, a bottle of water off the back of the desk. I'm going to, I think I'm going to be needing it today. So Acts chapter three is where we're going to be at this morning. And thank you. I forgot something else. Uh, handouts. Did anyone forget yours from last week? You're going to need it this week and next week. It's a three sermon time. Does anyone need a handout this morning? Okay. One up front. Somebody's going to need to bring. Okay. Anybody else need a handout? Okay. One up here. All right. If you end up needing one, stand up, wave vehemently. Somebody will notice you for sure. So we'll get it to you. Thank you. We were talking Wednesday night before I get started on this about how, I think it was Wednesday night or Sunday night, how uh, we need to be looking for opportunities. Some of we mentioned praying for opportunities. And I made the comment, sometimes we say we need to pray for, you know, God to give us opportunities to witness, God to give us opportunities. And I made the comment, uh, most of the time, it's not so much that we need the opportunities. We need to have our eyes open. We need to be looking for the opportunities that God brings along our path. And those are exciting. And, 
And I was praying for that this week. There was, uh, we were helping Russ with cleaning out Lloyd's place. And uh, this guy just walks by, wanted to come and help. And um, from all indications, he doesn't know that the Lord is his savior. And we had opportunity to speak with him and the, the relationship has started, it's good. And then uh, yesterday, uh, a couple of people were, were dumpster diving out back and finding some good stuff in Lloyd's, <laughs> Lloyd's dumpster, but uh, ended up being able to, to meet with two people and one of their set of parents. And it's just, you know, God brings opportunities. And I, I thank him for that and what we need to do. And I'm thankful that he, he helped me to be bold and take those opportunities. We need to do this and God will provide them. And let's just, let's take the opportunities to be a witness for Jesus. It's about him. It's not about us. And we need to remember that. So for what that's worth, back to this. Can you remember a time at some point in your life? I think everybody really can with this. Somebody did something nice for you. It's usually easy to look back. We can think of times when people have been kind. And if you are in the slightest bit normal, you desired, when somebody did something for you, you, you wanted to do something to show that you appreciated it. And it doesn't matter how little it is. It can just be a, a simple thing of showing you that they cared about you. It could just be a word. It doesn't matter what it is, but we want, unless you're really a calloused person, you don't want to be rude to them. You want to show appreciation for what they've done. It could be a simple thank you, right? Maybe it's writing a card out. Thank you for what you've done and sending them this card. Maybe you want to give them a hug. Nowadays, that may be not well received, but you want to do something in return. It, here's the point. It's normal. It is normal for you and me to be grateful. We should want to show gratitude. And when you see somebody else help someone, it kind of gets your attention. It's a big deal. Now, now think about this in a large scale. Imagine if you saw someone come to somebody else and say, you know what? I, d- I just want to be nice to you. I'm going to give you a new car. Now we'd be thinking, whoa, that was big. This was an awesome thing. But here's the point. It would get our attention, wouldn't it? And we would expect, how would you feel if somebody gave me Pick on me. Somebody gave me a brand new car and I said, that's nice, but I don't like that kind. Would you please take, just go give it to somebody else. Next time, get me a Chevy four-door pickup. That's what I wanted. You'd look at me like I was warped. And I would be. I would be really messed up. There should be gratitude shown. That's what we're going to see today. We're going to see a guy. We saw last week, the lame man, he got healed, right? This was huge. It's better than a new car. This man had been, he had been lame for over 40 years and had Peter and John come and did their miracle. And that guy looked up, stood up and said, guys, get out of my face. I want to go do my thing now. Just get out of my face. This would have been a whole different story. That guy would have been pathetic. But that's not what we see today. We've seen that initial healing. And today, this man is going to go with Peter and John. He's going to enter the temple. And this is going to be a really big deal. So what we're going to see, last week we saw the miracle. Today, we're going to see the aftermath of this miracle. We're going to see how it affected him. So before we look at it, for those of you who just got your handouts, let's uh, catch you up on your notes. And then we'll look at our new text. First thing we saw last week, we saw the lame man cured. The lame man was cured. And and this one, there was other miracles had been done, we're told. But this one, I I think, I think the reason this one is shown to us is because this is the one that generated the conflict. This is the one where the religious leaders come down on the disciples. And last week, we also briefly mentioned uh, how the gifts of healing, the other miracle gifts that we see people attempting to do today. We looked at those and and where there's error and where there's issues with it. Um, I'm not going to take time to go over those again today. But first point we saw under this, the custom of the men. The custom of the men. So Peter and John, we saw them going to the temple. They were opposites. So why was it that the two of them could go and worship together? Because they were together following Jesus. 
had they just been, and they were opposites. These guys really didn't have a lot in common except Jesus. And because of that relationship, they could be unified. It should be the same with us today. We can be unified as we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's, he's the common factor. We also saw under that same point that these guys, uh, Peter and John, were going up to the temple, and it wasn't the Sabbath day. This was, they, they weren't Sunday-only Christians. These men were serious about their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they didn't just put on their little face mask and come into church on Sunday and then go out and live differently all week long. They weren't Sunday-only Christians. And then we looked at the custom of that beggar. He had been there for probably 20-plus years. So this is where the guys were who were involved in our account. Then we looked at the second point, the craving. The craving of the beggar. And there was a lot of beggars in those days. And for the Jews, it was a normal thing for, the, for people who were Jewish to want to give to the beggars. That was one of the ways, and I'm using this in quotes, that they could earn righteousness. And they earned more righteousness if the person who was begging didn't know who gave them the gift. So what they would do is they'd walk by them and toss it over their shoulder. So the person wouldn't see them giving it. That way they got more points with God. And just like any works-based religion, it's going to fail them. It's not going to work. So they, the craving of the beggar was just for the money. He wanted what he could get to make his life comfortable like so many people today. Third thing we saw, the compassion of the apostles. And numerous things with this, they were willing to stop their schedule. They were willing to adjust what they were doing to help with the needs of someone else. We could spend the rest of the time there. That We need to have this attitude. We need to be willing to interrupt our own precious schedules. We also saw that they had the authority to do these miracles, but they, and they chose to do it, not just where there was fame, not just where there was big results. They chose to do it for one man who couldn't do a single thing to pay them back, who couldn't help them. They were willing to minister to anyone as we need to. And then we saw that man, he was completely ill. Luke, Luke used very specific terms to show that that healing that the man experienced was full, complete. He was totally healed. And that brings us to our passage today. And we're going to look, first of all here, Point two, the change that occurs. Change occurs. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll look at our new text. Father, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for loving us. Lord, I thank you that you are a good and a faithful God. Help us during this time. Lord, would you please help us to block out distractions? Help us to be focused on you. Help us to be desirous to hear from you. But Lord, I pray that you would give us a burden to want to be changed by you. Father, I, I ask that you would protect me as I preach, keep me free from error. Please help me not to be a distraction to the message that you desire to have presented. And Lord, most of all, I pray that in some way you would receive glory by our time and our efforts here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, point two, change occurs. Now, it is noticed, it's evident, verses one through seven, something big has happened. A notable work has been done, and when God is working, it doesn't matter who he's, who's around, what's going on. When God is working, it will impact people's lives, and this was absolutely no exception to the rule. At this point, the people directly who are being affected outside of Peter, John, and the lame man, are unsaved Jewish people. That's who's experiencing God's power. That's who's looking at it. Unsaved Jews are the ones watching this. But, but still, it's a miracle that's been done. And change is going to occur in people's lives. So that's what we're going to look at primarily, the change that's occurring in lives. But uh, there's going to be parallels as we go through this. In these examples, it's a beautiful parallel to the change that happens in our lives as we turn to Jesus Christ. Change happens. If you truly repent and you truly come to Christ, change does happen. And we're going to see those parallels as we go through here. So first point, the beggar is complete. The beggar is complete. Verses 8 and 9. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Now, it's really evident. Peter or Luke is pushing in those two verses. 
This man is leaping. He's walking. Now, just think of what has just happened to him. You've got a man who has been lame. He has been laying down, if you're sitting, for 40 plus years. And all of a sudden, he is walking and leaping. I got out of bed this morning, and I did not walk normal. I had to get my bearings, my leg, my, I had the sleep legs. And I was just out, my legs had to get used to having weight on them again. This guy did not limp around. This guy didn't stagger. He didn't have to learn like all of us would have to learn how to balance. This, this miracle that occurred in him was totally complete. No one would be able to do this. So the mirror, that's part of the miracle. And we're told here that he was leaping and the word there, the tense of that continually leaping. He was jumping. This man was rightfully excited. Now, notice too, and this is a, may seem like a small thing, but as he's leaping, middle of verse eight, he entered with Peter and John into the temple. This shows us that his healing was complete. And one of the ways it does this, and I had to put a picture up here. So if you can put this picture up behind me, you're, this is a picture of the stairs that go up to the temple. You are not gonna go up those stairs if you're limping. You're not gonna go up those stairs if you're struggling. It's, it's, a, it's a walk to get up the stairs. So the healing had to be complete, but keep this in mind. If he had club feet, which is what some thinks he had, he wouldn't be allowed in the temple. He's unclean, so he couldn't go in. Here, he is able now to freely enter the temple because people with deformities couldn't go in. And notice that, and, and I, I like this phrase, he's praising God, end of verse eight, end of verse nine, both times, he is praising God. I like the fact that he's giving praise to God and not like many would do, giving praise to Peter and praise to John. This man, he had his focus where it should have been. Now, we don't know at this point if this man had become a follower of Jesus yet. We don't know. But this we do know, his direction is right. He is praising God instead of praising people. So he's heading in the right direction. We're also told, uh, verse 9, all the people saw him. Everybody saw him. Everybody saw this man. And here's part of why. We're going to come back and revisit all of this, but he was not holding back his praise to God. People, listen to me. That should step on your toes. because It stepped all over mine. He was not holding back his praise to God. And it would have stood out. Now, this illustration I'm going to give you, I'm in no way complaining or fussing, nothing like that, okay? Have you ever noticed after a service, we all kind of stand around, we chat, and if some of these little guys have energy, you know what I'm talking about? And I'm looking at this aisle right now. This is, 25, this is 75 feet from here back to the back, and it's a long straight shot. This is a welcome invitation to take off and run. Maybe you don't feel that way. I do. And especially if you're coming this way, running down is a blast. And so what do we do? We're standing around, we're being proper. And we're all of a sudden we hear, and our eyes open, what happens? We notice this, right? Can you imagine, and I'm not gonna pick on anybody that would be here today, but a month ago, two months ago, excuse me, if Lloyd had been here and he had come in with his walker and we all know Lloyd, we all know that he would have been coming in slow and he would have gone and sat down. It would have been a rough thing to get in here with that walker. For those of you who don't know Lloyd, he's a 91 year old, passed away in, in August. But if he had come in here like that and we're sitting around being prim and proper and all of a sudden coming through this back door, Lloyd comes through, jumping and leaping and running up and down these aisles. Do you think it would get your attention? That's the picture. This man, these Jewish people knew this man. He had been sitting out there. He was a fixture. And so here he is, not the kids. Boy, if you will, this lame man running up and down the aisles, praising God. And 
I'm reading into the story. I don't know that this is true, but I can picture the Pharisees standing back with all of their robes and all of their pomp. How dare you worship God in this fashion? This is not what we do. You're to be somber. Can you imagine people today wanting to say something like that? No, we would be excited. This would be a big deal. Here's what's happening. This man, this lame man got people's attention. I think God wanted that. God wanted people focusing on what he had done. And everybody noticed it. Everyone's noticing what God had done. Now, let's bring this back for a minute. Can you see how this compares to our salvation experience? Think about that for a moment. Salvation, just like this lame man, when it happens, it happens at a set point in time. And when it happens, it's done. It's complete. You don't morph into your salvation. You don't grow, if you will. You don't get a little bit of salvation now and a little bit more later, a little bit more later. When it happens, it's done. This lame man was healed and he was healed in an instant. And it was complete. He had everything he needed at that moment in time. That's the same way it is with those who are genuinely saved. And, and get this, when we're genuinely saved, it will result in an outward praising of God. It will result in that. There will be us praising God. And, and, and just notice this point, other people are gonna notice so many times, and maybe you've heard this, my salvation is a personal experience. Well, in a point, to a point, yeah, it's between you and God, but it's public. It is massively public because you cannot hold back what God has done when he changed your life. It's a public thing. Let's move on. We'll come back to these. The beggar is clinging. The beggar is cleaning. Skip down to verse 11. And the lame man which was healed held Peter and John. Now this, this word held, that is a, that, that's the emphatic word in this sentence. That word means to hold forcibly. He wasn't letting go. He had a hold of Peter and John and there was no releasing. And here's what's happening. Do you see there's a sense of gratitude there is a loyalty and a devotion that is being shown, yes, to Peter and John, but also to the Lord. They, they made sure to tell him, hey, but this is not us. We're doing this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the one that's responsible for your healing. And this man is showing devotion. His life has been totally changed. And he's grateful for this. See what this man is is a walking advertisement for the power of God. He is a walking advertisement to how Jesus can change a life. When you and I become followers of Jesus, you know what we become? Ambassadors, walking advertisements for the power of God to change a life. And he does that. If you've received Jesus Christ, your eternal destiny has been changed. That's true. But it's not something, okay, I get this when I die. Your life has been changed. He changes you. He makes you a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. He changes your life now, not at death. You receive a new relationship at the very moment of salvation. Here's the problem. When that happens, we're grateful. I, think, I don't think I've met a person who has come to Jesus Christ who didn't have a gratefulness in them as they were coming to Christ. There was a, uh, an excitement about them, but the sad thing that we run into is that, that excitement has a tendency of fading. That excitement has a tendency to, to, to dwindle. It's a continual fight. It's a continual fight in my life to keep idols out of my life. It's hard because they're constantly pulling and wanting to, to have you come back. That's where Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said real clear, you can't serve two masters. 
You're going to love one, hate the other. You're going to hold one, you're going to cleave to the other. They're going to pull you apart. They're going to tear you apart when you try to hold the two. You can't serve God, and in that case, mammon. You can't serve God in money. Point being, when we become a follower of Jesus, there's that initial cleaning. We've got to keep asking God to give us that passion, to give us a heartbeat as our devotion shifts and ask him, and maybe you need to do that this morning. We need to ask him to forgive us as our passion has left him and gone to, to stuff or to self. We need to be asking for his forgiveness. This beggar is a good example. He is clinging and he's serious about this relationship that he's entering. Third thing we see, people are curious. People are curious. Back up to verse 10. And they knew that it was he which set at alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. We saw that, talked about that beautiful gate last time. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which ha had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed, healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. So we're told, verse 10, they knew. That word was a neat word. Here's what it means. That word knew, they put the pieces together. It made sense. We might say today, they got it. It clicked. Everything is making sense. And the, the tense of that word is continually. And I, when I read that, it's kind of, it was strange because it's not like I look, they look, one person looked at this lame man and they got it and they continually got it and they got it again. The idea here is, as this guy's running around the temple, I got it. And then he got it. And then they got it. Everybody that's seeing this guy doing this, everybody's getting it. Every, it's clicking. Every, it's making sense to everyone that is there. They knew who this guy was. Middle of the verse, they were filled with wonder and amazement. We know this word filled. This is the word. We saw it back in Acts chapter 2, 22, where the Holy Spirit came and he filled that home. We know it best from Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Spirit, be controlled by the Spirit. We know it from there. These people were being controlled, if you will. They were filled with this wonder and amazement. And these are two really strong nouns, the words that he used, one, the wonder, they were shocked. They were, they were flabbergasted. And this amazement, the, the literal meaning of this is to throw the mind off balance. The word I would use, the phrase I would use, they were totally blown away. This is what their attitude is like right now, is they're seeing this happening. And it was so much. They're so excited and in wonder about what's going on. We're told the end of this verse, or in verse uh, 11, that they ran together. They ran together out to Solomon's porch. They did not go out in an orderly fashion to hear a message. They didn't all walk out and go listen. They, there was a stampede that happened trying to get out to hear what was going on because this was such a, an unknown thing that they were experiencing. Now keep in mind, it says here they're going out to Solomon's porch. Back in John 10, that's the same place that Jesus went. And Jesus would go there often. He was preaching there, and you'll know this phrase. He said, I and my Father are what? One. And they all received it, right? No, they took up stones to kill him. Some of the people that are here and listening to Peter are probably some of the same people who were there when Jesus said, I and my father are one, and they took up stones to want to kill him. And now they're here listening to Peter. Do you see the grace that God is giving to these, these Jews who have rejected their Messiah? Chance number who knows how many, and he's giving them more grace. This is a beautiful picture for us because that's what God keeps doing in our lives. Now, again, let's just take this, this whole scenario, comparing this to our salvation. This man was born lame. You and I, we're born lame. We are born with sin, and we are, just like he was, we are hopeless. 
There is not one thing that we can do to earn any kind of a merit with God. We're hopeless. And just like that man, because of his uncleanness, could not approach the temple, we cannot approach God because of our uncleanness. This man was poor. He had absolutely nothing to offer God. What do you have to offer God? Silch. We have nothing to, to, to bring to the table. And no matter how much begging this man did, no matter how much he got to try to, to, to make things better, he couldn't fix that problem. Same thing with us. And then grace happened. Grace happened in that man's life. It wasn't his doing. He, it was something that God did. And when God exercised grace in that man's life, he was immediately cleansed. He was immediately able to come before God. Just as today, when people come into a relationship with Jesus, immediate access to the Lord himself, to the throne room. We have that. We have that privilege because of what? God is done. And then the result, he ran and he started the excitement with other people. As you and I come to a relationship with Jesus, there is a desire to share his word. It will be there. That can grow. But that initial excitement and gratefulness for what God has done, that is what happens in the life of a follower of Jesus today. Now, these miracles, this, when miracles happen like this, miracles do not produce conviction. Miracles do not produce faith. But they sure can break the ground so that the seed can be planted, so that it can find fertile soil. And that's, what, that's what's happening here. And here, now Peter, he's got all this ground broken. And what is he going to do? He's going to give the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing from the word of God. That's the, God has just prepared the pulpit, if you will, for Peter to come and preach. And Peter is going to jump in totally. He's going to take advantage of this opportunity. And that takes us to point three. The people are confronted. The people are confronted. So we see this is Peter's second sermon that we had, at least that we have recorded. And and he sees what's going on. He sees this opportunity, and he doesn't hesitate. He goes for it. He's looking for it. Do you realize that as you and I, and let's go back to that phrase I mentioned a minute ago, as we are controlled by the Holy Spirit, as we are allowing him to lead, we're following the scriptures. As that is happening, we are better equipped to to recognize those divine opportunities, those, those God moments. We're able to see, we're able to, to understand, yeah, hey, this is one, I need to go after this one. And we're able to recognize these. We do that by Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That's how we have that filling of the Holy Spirit. Those are parallel passages. And I appreciate Peter so much with his boldness to speak up for the Lord. That's what we need to learn from this. And that is what he did. So let's, let's look at these verses. First point, he contradicts the Jews' assumptions. He contradicts the Jews' assumptions. Verse 12, when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel. Now, notice again, he's talking to the Jews. That's his target audience. So rest of verse 12, why marvel you at this? Or why are you looking so earnestly on us as though we, by our own power or holiness, we had made this man to walk? Why are you looking at us? So you got to assume that these people, maybe you've seen people give the look and you know, you can figure out what they're thinking. These people are giving Peter and John the look and it's like, wow, you guys are miracle workers. You guys are real big. I want to know this. And they're all excited. And what Peter is saying is this. Don't be in all of us. We didn't do anything. Don't be looking at us. Now, you got to ask. He said here, why are you marveling at this? Wouldn't you be marveling if you just saw a lame man jumping up and down and leaping and praising God? Think about this. Just a few months earlier, 
they had seen bigger and better works than this by Jesus. They had watched Jesus several months before healing people, doing all kinds of stuff. It was very, very noticeable. They should have been expecting some of this if they'd already seen Jesus doing it. Why wouldn't they be? Because we killed him. We killed that man. We watched that guy do all these miracles, but we put an end to him. But we've got a problem. It's happening again. All this is starting all over. But he's dead. Could it be? Isn't that the rumors that are floating around Jerusalem? The resurrection? Where is the body? Could it be that this one who did all these things that they're giving credit for? Because they're saying they don't have the ability to do this stuff. Peter is setting this stage up really nice. And God has worked this so that they can see this is Jesus. He's the one. He's the miracle worker. So they were marveling. Peter's saying, you shouldn't be marveling. And we'll see why. Look at verse 13. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son, Jesus. Now, note he uses very specific terms. And this phrase, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the same term he used when, when uh, Moses went to release the children of Israel. He said, this is the God, this is him. But notice the specifics. He didn't say it's the God of Abraham. Because that would include, he'd have to then be including Ishmaelites. He didn't say God of Abraham and Isaac. Now you got to include Esau's descendants. The promises weren't to the Ishmaelites. The promises weren't to the Edomites. He said, this is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is for the Israelites. The Jews are the ones who have these promises. And he said, these promises, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. This is the God that you claim to serve. We're, on the, we're serving God. The God of our fathers, our God. Here's what he's done. He has glorified. Okay, that word means to elevate to a position of power to elevate to a position of great honor, of great value. They're happy there. The Jews won't fuss with this one. He's glorified his son. They're not going to fuss with this one. This word here that's translated as son, this is the same word from Isaiah. It's used four times in Isaiah. Two of them we know pretty good. Isaiah 42.1 and Isaiah 52.13. The word is translated servant, and it is a messianic title. You're going to see this all through this section right now. Peter is pointing out very clear. God has glorified his Messiah. If he had stopped there, no arguments. He has glorified his Messiah, but he adds on this one more word, Jesus. He has glorified his son, Jesus. That's the name that needs to be proclaimed. That's the name that we have got to proclaim. That word, Jesus is the Old Testament Joshua. The definition there was Yahweh is salvation. But I like in Matthew, remember the angel comes in Matthew 1 and he tells Mary, you're going to call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Yahweh is salvation. He's sending his son to save people from their sins. What Peter is saying very clearly here for these Jewish people is, Jesus is Messiah. They need to know this. They need to understand Jesus is Messiah. Now, can you imagine the thoughts going through their head? But we killed him. We killed this one that you're saying is Messiah. And if he did this, could it be that the resurrection really did happen? Is it possible that, that Jesus has risen from the dead. Now notice what, Pete, what Peter does not do here. And we're going to go into this. This is important. Peter does not go from you killed him to you need to, you need to trust Jesus to save you. He didn't do that. Peter is going to start with the negative. And I want to suggest to you, in our culture, we mess this up a lot. 
We totally messed this up. We've got this easy believism mentality and we just want to oh, just trust Jesus. Why? Why should I trust Jesus? What have I done wrong? You know what? People need to hear the bad news. And that's what Peter's about to do. Point B, he's going to condemn their sins. He condemns their sin. If people do not understand that they have sinned, that they have committed abominations against God, that they are in deep, deep trouble, why would they need to repent? There's no need. And keep in mind, as Peter goes through these verses, 13, we're going to be looking at 13 to 15, as he goes through these verses, keep in mind that he is surrounded by the same people that killed Jesus. It would be no different than me walking out in an area like our parking lot out here, standing right in the middle and bunches of people, thousands of people coming around me who didn't like the person I'm representing and me proclaiming that message. I admire Peter for going through this scary time. But let's, let's look at the charges he makes. First thing he says, verse number or middle of verse 13, whom you delivered up. You, that's the emphasis word, you did it. You, you delivered up Jesus. That word delivered, to give over to the power of another. Remember, they, got, they, they, they bought off Judas, and Judas delivered Jesus over to the leaders. And then the leaders delivered Jesus, Jesus to the Romans. This delivering is what happens. And Jesus predicted that back in Luke 9, 44, he predicted they will deliver me over to the Gentiles. And then later on in Luke, Luke 21, he said, they're going to deliver you. My followers, they're going to deliver you to the Gentiles. Next chapter, that's what's coming. They get delivered. This is what's going on in their lives. And think of it this way. They delivered their deliverer. They delivered their deliverer. It's just ironic that they turned on the very one that could help them. But think about this a minute. Turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. The Jews delivered Jesus. Peter's making that statement very clear. Romans 8, 32 says, He, that God the Father, that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Who delivered Jesus in Romans? God the Father. Turn over to Galatians. Galatians 2, in verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and... That word gave, same word as is translated deliverer, and gave himself for me. Jesus here gave, he's the one that did the giving. So you've got God the Father in our passage in Romans. You've got Jesus in our passage in Galatians. Here he's saying, you did it. So who delivered Jesus? The answer is, Yes, all of them were guilty. God the Father, God, the, the triune God was actively desiring Jesus to go to the cross for us. God desired this. This was in God's plan from eternity past. God was in this. But the Jews who did it, they're fully culpable. culpable. They are guilty. They made a choice. They had, they had to do that. They, they were guilty because they did this. They are fully guilty. So they gave up Jesus. We also see the end, uh, next phrase, they denied him. That word means to forcibly renounce. This was not just, a, oh, I don't want anything to do with them. This was something that was forcible. Now keep in mind, this is the same crowd who was crying out, Hosanna to the son of David, 
Okay, paraphrasing. We love you. We receive you. You're our Messiah. We're going to follow you. We're all about you, Jesus. Come on. And less than a week later, that same crowd saying what? Crucify him. One week. And they turn on him that quick. They denied him that fast. And he's saying here, they did that right in front, right in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. So here you have Pilate. Pilate had pronounced Jesus to be innocent. Three times he said, I find no guilt in this man. He's totally innocent. He desired to let Jesus go. And the Jews said, no, we don't want anything to do with that. If you're a friend of Caesar's, you're going to kill him. You've got to kill him. They were denying him. They were actively against Jesus. Notice verse 14. He repeats it, but you deny. So he's pushing this point. You forcibly rejected and turned against your Messiah. Notice the next phrase in um, verse 14. And desired a murderer to be granted unto you. It wasn't enough that they turned against the good. They embraced the bad. They didn't just say, kill Jesus. They said, give us a murderer. Is this not? This is like today. People are calling Isaiah 520. Woe to them to call evil good and good evil. This is our culture. This is what America right now is all about. This is pathetic. This is what it's nothing. This shows you it's nothing new. This is exactly what the Jews were doing. And that phrase he uses, desire to murder to be granted unto you. That word granted has the idea of to allow a favor. So here's what they were saying. We want you, Pilate, to do us a favor. Do something nice for us. Show grace to us by giving us this murderer. This would be a nice thing for you to do. That's the word granted. These people were, they were messed up in their sin. This was a horrible thing they're doing. They're saying, show us grace. And they had no idea that at that very moment, God himself was showing grace to them. This is a, a perfect picture of what's being done in our lives today. So they, they denied him. And then verse 15, they killed the prince of life. They went as far as to let murder happen. That's what, that's what they're guilty of. And Peter is pushing that. But Peter, I, I skipped some phrases in here. Peter made it very, very obvious what they had done. Notice the titles here that we, as we go back through these. You denied the Holy One. That phrase, and again, keep in mind, he's talking to Jews. They knew that phrase. That is a phrase that is messianic. It comes from Psalm 16. Remember in Psalm 1610, he will not suffer his Holy One to see corruption. It's a messianic title. And the Jews there knew it. They knew the Messiah would be set apart for God. He would be set apart for God's use. That's what the Messiah was all about. And it was a well-known title. Then he says, you, you denied the Holy One and the just, the righteous one. He was innocent, and you chose someone guilty. You put aside the innocent one, the righteous one. The same word is used in Jeremiah 23, 5, when he says God would raise up a righteous branch. The Jews knew that title. And the, the one we know probably the best is Isaiah 53, 11, his righteous servant. They denied the righteous one, the Messiah. So this is another messianic title. Now, the, the next title we see is not a messianic title that I could find. Verse 15, he, you killed the prince of life. That prince means the, the, the leader, the author, the creator of life. I read this quote. I thought it was good. So this is a contrast. The Jews gave death to the one who had given them life and who wanted to give them eternal life. They killed him. Peter, what he's doing in these verses, 
is he is pointing very clearly, Jesus is the life giver. Jesus is the sustainer of life. That means he's deity. The Messiah is deity, but he saves the best for last. On verse uh, 15, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses, the resurrection. God raised him from the dead. God undid what you did. All this evil you were doing, God just undid it. God took care of it by raising him by the resurrection. What's been the big debate these last two months in Jerusalem? What happened to the body? Where did it go? Bodies don't just disappear. And they're right. Bodies don't just disappear. So where's the body? See, the, the resurrection, that's the key to the gospel. If we don't have the resurrection, we might as well pack it up and go home because there is no hope. The resurrection is why we are here today. We needed that, and God did that for us. We had the resurrection. We had it. See, the, the Calvary, the killing of Jesus, that was like man's last word. We don't want him. We're going to kill him. Here's our final stand. We did it. We killed him. And then we have God's last word, the resurrection. That's what we needed. So God, again, undid what they did. And he says here, we are witnesses. There's your fulfilling with Deuteronomy 19.15, two witnesses, three witnesses. They are the ones who witnessed this happen. So here's the point. People, you are guilty. There's his main point. You're guilty. Do you realize the same thing's true today? We're guilty. Every one of us in this room are guilty. Any rejection of Christ at any point in time through human history, we're guilty for rejecting him. People today may say, you know, well, I didn't kill him. I didn't say crucify him. What they were doing was denying him, pushing him aside. They didn't want him. Is that not what people do today? Today, we've got people who will say, well, yeah, I know I need, I understand the gospel, but I don't need this. I'm not that bad of a person. Yes, you are. You are bad enough to deserve hell. And for us to reject Jesus Christ, the only opportunity we have to make peace with God, we're under judgment. And we've got a massive problem. That's what Peter is pointing out in that point. Point C, he credits Jesus. He credits Jesus. So Peter and John, they stated very clearly that, that the miracle was not of them. So verse 16, and his name, okay, his that refers to the one who was resurrected. So in Jesus' name, his name, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> his name, that name refers to refer, the idea with that is his power, it's, it's his authority, who he is. It's the person of Jesus. His name, his power through faith in his name, the through, on behalf of, on account of, faith in his name. Now, I take this in, through faith in his name. The faith is that of Peter and John. I don't see that as the faith of the lame man. The lame man, he put up his hand wanting some money. He wasn't thinking at all about getting healed. He just wanted something. He wanted some money. So I don't see this being his faith as much as it was Peter and John's faith. So his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. So this man has been totally healed. And it's by the power of Jesus. That's the point in that first part of that verse. It was Jesus' power that healed this man, whom you see and know. I like that the word see there has the idea. It's where we get our word theater from. The idea with that is you people have seen this. You've scrutinized this. You have been watching this man so closely. You see who he is. You're seeing him jumping up and down. You know that something big has happened here. And it was not us that did it. 
It was Jesus. It was through Jesus' power that this man was healed. Who you see and know. So they got it. They are totally understanding beyond the shadow of a doubt that God has done a miraculous work in this man's life. That's what they're pushing for in this verse. End of verse 16. Yea, the faith by which the faith which is by him, God, had Jesus Christ, I should say. The faith which is by Jesus has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You're all witnesses to what Jesus has done. All of you have seen this. You can't deny this. My guess, they're probably remembering passages like Isaiah 35, the lame will leap. They're going to be remembering this. It's not the first time they've seen it. They saw this under Jesus' ministry. So if Jesus was killed and these miracles are still happening by Jesus, then he must be resurrected. He is alive. That's the point. That's Peter's goal is to point to the Lord. Verse 17, last point. Compassion is shown. Compassion is shown. Verse 17 and 18. And now, brethren, I know, I, that was the word for no, I know that through ignorance you did this, and did, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before has showed by the mouth of his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Up to this point, this message has been, it's been kind of brutal. This message has been rough. He's saying real clear, you killed him and you deserve death. You deserve judgment. He is showing them that they are guilty. This is direct. This is harsh. In these verses, it's like Peter lightens up. And he's showing them, people, there's hope. You're not doomed. There is hope in Jesus. He uses, just notice how he starts it. Brethren. And now, brethren, it's a gentle term. It's a unity term. It's a term of tenderness. Peter knows he's no better than they are. He denied his Lord three times. And he, to whom much is given, much shall be required. He knew he, he had the answers and he denied. He knows he is no better than these men. And I'm sure the shot that Peter, of all people, would be gentle. They know that he's the one who took out the sword and walked off a guy's ear. This is a known fact. They know who he is. So here you have Peter showing grace. Peter, the people needed to hear that they were sinners. People today who say, you know, I don't want to be harsh with people. I don't want to tell them they're sinners. The most loving thing you can do is tell someone they've got a sin problem. So they'll need, see the need to correct it. I don't want to fool people into thinking they're all right when they're not all right. Peter showed love and compassion here. But he, he, he lightens up for them and he says, look, I know you did this through ignorance. You didn't know what you were doing. And, and this is the part that gets me. Keep in mind, you got people all around you probably pointed over. Same thing with your leaders. The ones that are over there listening to me now. They didn't know it either. Do you see the grace that's involved here? The grace of saying, no, even your leaders, they did this ignorantly. Paul said the same thing in 1 Corinthians 2, 8. They didn't understand or they wouldn't have crucified him. Jesus said the same thing. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Or did they understand that they were killing an innocent man? Yes. They framed him. No matter how you look at it, they framed him. But here's what they, here's where their ignorance came. They didn't understand that man is our Messiah. They didn't get it. He did not fit their their predetermined ideas from the Old Testament that he should have been meeting. And so they killed him. Verse 18, those things. The end of the verse, that Christ should suffer. That's what he's talking about. That's the, those things. The prophecies that Christ should suffer. Those things which God had showed, he had made it very clear. He had announced it beforehand, is what that word means. He announced beforehand that Christ should suffer, and now he has fulfilled it. 
God used, and I don't understand how he can do this. God used their sinful choices. He used their sinful decision to kill the Messiah, to glorify himself and to help everybody. God used this. He, uh, and it's like the Genesis 60-20 principle. You meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And God alone, he can do this. He can turn our negative, he can turn our sin and somehow use it to glorify himself. He can make it positive just like he did with these Jews on that day. He took their sin and turned it to our good. Do you see the graciousness of our God? He did that for us while we hated him. While we were in the process of rejecting him, he's doing this for us. That's how good our God is. Let's remember this. When you and I are tempted to write somebody off as unreachable, they're not, they're not unreachable. That thief on the cross I had seen him getting nailed up there. It might have been my thought. Those guys are done. They're unreachable. And he's in glory today. Some of the people I've run into this week, you, mean, you just, you don't see. You know, how can God work in them? How could God work in me? I see what he did with me. No one is unreachable. Our God is showing grace today. And Christian, listen, if you are his follower today, if you are a follower of Christ, you got to ask yourself, am I willing, like we've been seeing here, am I willing to show my devotion? Am I willing to show my gratitude to my God for the grace he gave to me by living for him? Am I willing to have compassion and lovingly point people to Jesus? It will not happen accidentally. It's a choice we make. We have, to be, we have to be willing to go look for it. It's not an accident. Are you grateful for what God has done for you? We need to think on this. Let's stand for a moment. If you're here today and you have never become a follower of Jesus, you're not like this lame man. You have nothing to be excited about. Nothing. John 3.18 makes it very clear, before we come to Christ, we are already under his judgment. There is nothing to be excited about until you come to Jesus Christ. You can make peace with him. You can enter a relationship with him today, but it doesn't come by anything we do. It's his terms. He is the one who has given all so that we can come to him. He's the one that does the drawing. We need to repent and we need to trust. We need to follow. If you've never received Jesus Christ as Savior, I would love nothing more than today to take you through this book and show you how you can make peace with the God that we've offended. Christian, are you outwardly grateful? All of us can say we're inwardly grateful. That, that's cheap. It's real, but it's just, it can be cheap. Are you outwardly grateful for what he's done for you? Other people will see that. Other people will hear that. Do you have compassion on the lost? I want to encourage you, as we just have a few moments, just commit to God to sharing the good news of what he's done for you with the lost. We need to commit that. And it's not just, let's see people converted to Jesus Christ, to see them saved, we're, we're called to make disciples. That's a lifetime commitment. That's what we're called to do. I encourage you, commit to him and you today to show your gratefulness and point other people to him. You do business with God as he deals with you.
Dan, could you close us today, please? Father, we thank you this morning for allowing us to be here to hear this message. Thank you for reminding us this morning that you are our only friend that ever had an eternal salvation. We thank you for going to the cross and dying for us. We just pray, Lord, that you will always keep us mind for the great deed that you did for each other. We pray that you will so with us now to believe in what the Lord set out to do. Help us to do everything according to you. All these things we ask in thy name and for thy name.